Hi everyone, Carl Steele here recording a video for English 4113, 4114 for spring 2022 about Lucy Delaney's book, From the Darkness Cometh the Light or Struggles from Freedom, which she published in 1891 in St. Louis with a small press dedicated mostly to uh, Christian publications. So you can imagine why a book written so respectably should have found a home there. What I have here on the on the right is a picture of Lucy Delaney that was printed with this book and also a bit of the third lawsuit that involves her in St. Louis in the 1840s. This text was not read very widely uh, in its immediate period, when it was after it was published, 1891, but it starts to get some more interest when it's included in a history of uh, anti-slavery work in the uh, first decade of the 20th century. And then in the 1980s, it really starts to attract a lot more scholarly attention, and now it's regularly taught. So it really sometimes takes a long time for a book to find the audience it deserves. So we can pose the question of why when she's quite uh, advanced in her life that she should look back about 50 years and choose to write a book about her legal struggle to obtain her freedom and about her mother's legal struggle to obtain her freedom. So we've looked at Equiano and his very kind of individual commercial freedom that he obtained. We've looked at David Walker's call for armed uprising. We've looked at the kind of radical and almost incomprehensible act that Setha it engages in, in Beloved. And now we have an, a very different approach to these things, which is uh, the mechanism of legal force. And why should she do this? Well, one of the things perhaps is that she's looking around in this period and seeing lynching going on, which is a mostly uh, anti-Black white terrorism designed to shut down and destroy Black attempts to obtain civil rights in the post-Civil War era. And one of the mechanisms that anti-lynching activists were calling for was legal redress. They wanted to, the federal government to maintain its armed military presence in the South, which it withdrew in the, in the Compromise of 1870. Three, I believe. And with the result that uh, Black people who were in the South were, were left to the tender mercies of the Ku Klux Klan and other, other groups. And so she wants the federal government, the law, to intervene to protect people. And this book maybe is talking about a time when the law was actually, at least in one small way, on the side of Black people, which it often isn't in this country. So um, she also might have looked to something like this. It was a very promising case from 1885, probably uh, five to six years before she published this book, a uh, work called Stewart versus the Sioux, sorry, a case called Stewart versus the Sioux, which is uh, part of a response actually to the Supreme Court uh, invalidating the 1875 Civil Rights Act uh, after the 18, sorry, 1877 compromise. So what happens is that several sisters, all of whom are named Stewart, is their last name, or are black, are traveling on a steamship in Maryland uh, between Maryland and Virginia, I believe, and they find that the second class accommodations, which are reserved to black people, are really substandard. They often don't have sheets, the, or what linen there is is dirty, the pillows are inadequate or missing. Uh, they just don't get the service that they, they really ought to get. And so they buy first class tickets and they <laughs> park themselves in uh, the white cabins with cabins that they had paid for. And of course, the steamship operators drive them out and say, you're not allowed to sleep here. They force them to sleep on deck. And this is all quite well organized. So they, they eventually bring a lawsuit and uh, sue the steamship company for libel and mistreatment. And they win. They win not only the right to ride where they want to, but they win uh, damages. They get money actually out of this. And so one of the things that comes out of this is something called the Mutual United Brotherhood of Liberty which uh, sets the goals to use all legal means within our power to procure and maintain our rights as citizens of this common country. So Lucy Delaney is probably looking into cases like this, which are, are pretty well known in the circle she's running in, which is a, a respectable black bourgeois society in St. Louis. Um, what she doesn't know is coming is uh, Plessy versus Ferguson 1896, which is a, a case in, uh, out of uh, Louisiana where a man named um, uh, Plessy is suing a 
railroad company and uh, and wanting to be provided appropriate accommodations, comfortable, decent accommodations, instead of being forced to ride in substandard accommodations as a black man, the Supreme Court uh, rules against him and that inaugurates many, many, many decades really up through the 1950s and 1960s of black people being legally barred from um, sharing accommodations from white people in many parts of this country and thereby being provided with uh, substandard or, or inadequate accommodations, whether in uh, hospital care or uh, hygiene or schooling, etc. cetera. Um, so she doesn't know that 1896 is about to happen, but she does know that 1885 happened. That is probably driving her to write this work. So these, this is the context of this thing being, being produced. Uh, but it is, I think, surprising to you if you have never encountered such a thing. So the, the freedom suits that are going on in St. Louis in this period, really from the uh, early part of the 18th century, up to 1850, there are hundreds of them. We've got a lot of records of them of, uh, who are suing basically on, on two things primarily. One is the idea that if you're born free, you're always free. So people are bringing lawsuits saying that they were, although they're currently enslaved, that they were not born enslaved or that they were, they were freed and that they should, cannot thereby be re-enslaved, that freedom is something that once you have it, it can never be taken away. So they sue on that basis. They also often sue on the case of having some kind of extended residence in nearby Illinois, which is a free state. If you're able to show that you're there for a certain amount of time, you can say, well, I've been in a free state and on free soil for long enough that there, I've thereby automatically gained my freedom. So if the person who's enslaving them takes them to Illinois and doesn't register them, which they're supposed to do officially, then they can use that uh, as, as a way to sue for their freedom. So Lucy Delaney, uh, however, it provides the only extended first person account of such a suit. So that's one of the reasons why this book from 1891 is so valuable. Although she's looking back about 50 years, she still does provide the only narrative we have of how these things might have looked in practice and how they might have felt emotionally to the person who is suing for their freedom. And this lasts only until 1850 when we get the Dred Scott decision, which is what, one of the most cruel decisions that we have passed down from the Supreme Court, where Chief, Chief Justice Taney of the U.S. Supreme Court says, quote, Dred Scott is not a citizen of the state of Missouri, as alleged in his declaration, because he is a, a Negro of African descent. His ancestors were of pure African blood and were brought into this country and sold as Negro slaves. With that result, we have basically a declaration that no Black person in this country can ever uh, get representation in court. They can't sue for anything because they are simply not citizens. So that's what happens. 1850 shuts down the freedom suit. So the fact that Lucy Delaney is able to do this in the 1840s is significant because several years after she would not have been able to do this. Incidentally, Seth and Beloved, that material that happens in 1855, you recall. So it's post Dred Scott it's when the initial part of that novel takes place. So here's what happens in the Lucy Delaney. I just want to walk you through it. Uh, if it's a little hard to keep straight in your head, because it is that time of the semester. So her mother, Polly Wash, is born free, but she's kidnapped from Illinois into slavery in St. Louis when she's quite young, but not so young that she doesn't remember the condition of being free. Um, then she ends up enslaved not in the first place she's enslaved, but it's, she's sold to the household of Major Taylor Berry. Uh, while she's there, she's treated not terribly. She marries another enslaved person and she has two children, Nancy and Lucy. I say marries on quotation marks because of course as an enslaved person, she has no uh, legal right to be married. That family relationships are not respected in any form of slavery, no matter where we are in the world. Uh, Major Barry, uh, being a Southerner, a white Southerner, uh, is very keenly connected to his honor. And one of the things they did in those days is they fought duels. They they went out and shot each other. They felt insulted. They stabbed each other with a sword. They're real fools about that. Uh, he had intended to set everybody free upon his death, but that's not what happened. Instead, his widow marries a man named Robert Walsh. And then when she dies, Robert Walsh sells Polly's husband down south. At that point, Polly is absolutely horrified. Um, she's lost her husband. She's got her two daughters. 
And there's a kind of, well, you can imagine her maybe trying to do something like what Satha did. This is not what she does. Uh, she just schemes and schemes and schemes. So Major Barry's daughter uh, marries a man from Philadelphia. And when she goes out on honeymoon with him, uh, she has Nancy accompany her on, the, on that honeymoon. And while they're in near Niagara Falls, Nancy makes a break for it. She escapes to Toronto, Canada, and meets up with a woman that Polly knows there, a Black woman who had, had herself escaped Canada several years before. So Polly has connections, and Nancy manages to install herself safely in Canada. Meanwhile, Major Barry's daughter comes back to St. Louis and tells Polly, your daughter ran away, and Polly pretends to be angry. But of course, in private, she rejoices, and she sings these strange songs. That's what Lucy says. Then uh, Major Barry's daughter threatens to sell Polly down south. And so at that point, Polly just escapes to Chicago and she's caught up with there. She's, she's captured and there's a, almost a riot to, to prevent her from being taken back into slavery. But she's very frightened about what's going to be done to her daughter, Lucy, who's still in St. Louis. So she returns to St. Louis, but when she's there, then she sues for her freedom, again, perhaps on the basis of her being born free, perhaps on the basis of having been in Illinois and not registered. And meanwhile, um, while Lucy is also threatened to be sold down south because she's being uh, rather terribly treated by the people who are enslaving her. So she runs to where her mother is, and then her mother sues separately for Lucy's freedom, but not as her mother. The reason she does this is because if Polly Wash loses her freedom suit, that means that she's recognized legally as having been born enslaved. And therefore, anybody who is born from her would necessarily be enslaved. So it would be premature for Polly Wash to sue for her daughter's freedom prior to obtaining her own freedom. So she brings a suit as Lucy's dear friend denying that, that particular relationship. This becomes a legal problem actually uh, during Lucy's case because the court uh, will say, well, she's not actually her mother, see? Look, she didn't even claim herself as her mother during the lawsuit, but eventually things turn out okay. Lucy's held in prison for almost a year and a half. During that time, Polly wins her case. And having done that, it's much, much easier for Lucy, therefore, to obtain her own freedom. Because then at that point, they're able to argue vociferously in court that, in fact, Lucy is Polly's daughter. That they've seen them behave as mother and daughter repeatedly. And then there's a third case, which I had the screenshot of the, the lawsuit there on the first slide, which is where Polly sues again. This is for damages for false imprisonment. Um, that, unfortunately, that case does not bear any fruit. They, they don't win any money on the basis of that. But that uh, all resolves itself in 1844. So that's that's more or less, that's a freedom suit narrative. But we also have the family narrative. And I want you to think about this. I'm just going to ask you to think about this, not, not to write about it. Just think about it in relationship to the no novel Beloved. So I have some screenshots here from a website that's dedicated to uh, providing some advertisements from the Southwestern Christian Advocate, an African-American newspaper of the later 19th century. And they had a regular column called Lost Friends, which is where people were saying, um, I've lost contact with this member of my family, oftentimes because they were sold away from me, sort of like Polly Wash's husband. And I'd like to reconnect with them now that slavery is officially over. Is there any way that maybe people know this person and they can, they can get us in contact with them? I would like to see my mother again, my husband again, my sister again, et cetera. These are heartbreaking things to read. So I'll read one of them out loud. Dear editor, I wish to inquire for my uncles, Frank, Sam, and Joe, who went from Kemper County, Mississippi. Their mother's name is Penny Pollock. Joe ran away from Dr. A. Brown during the war, and the last I heard of him, he was in Chicago, Illinois. Frank left to go to Texas with John Warren, and I've heard that he is there. S Sam is in Louisiana. Their mother is still living in Kemper County, Mississippi, as are also their sister, Mary and brother Redden, my father. Address me at Herbert Kemper 
Uh, Herbert, Kemper County, Mississippi, Samuel Pollock, he wants to reunite his family. And you can see, if you read through, if you click on this, uh, if you look, or if you look it up online, you can read through a number of these advertisements and they really give you a sense of, uh, of the dislocation of families and the desperate desire to reconnect with them in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, and so on. And I think about this in relation to, um, to Lucy's story. So Lucy Delaney marries, um, and, but unfortunately, her first husband dies in a steamship accident. And so then she has, she marries again, a man, a man named Delaney, hence her name, Lucy Delaney. They have four children, two of whom die in their infancy, and then they have a son and daughter, both of whom die in their 20s. So the Lucy and, and her husband uh, outlive their children, which is a, a, a terrible thing, but they do live a very long life. And Lucy is able to establish herself really as a very respectable woman in St. Louis. She's a, a member of various uh, official societies and is clearly, clearly respected. And, and we know a fair amount about her life in that period. Um, her sister who had got to Canada marries a farmer there and she continues to live there although it's clear that Lucy sees her again at least once once more in her life because after Polly dies her uh, Lucy's mother uh, Lucy manages to find her father perhaps with one of these lost friends advertisements but he's been away for 45 years he's been living way in the south he has friends down there he's a broken old man he's been worked and worked and worked and he comes and finding that Polly is already dead by the time he gets back to reconnect with his daughters um, he doesn't want to live with them anymore he wants to go back and be with his friends so Lucy does it's is doesn't have that relationship. And then we have the strangeness of a relationship to her own mother, who's not able to be there at the trial. If you read through Lisa Delaney's Out of the Darkness, you see that her mother's lack of presence at the trial is something that hurts her very keenly. But we can say, well, it's possible that Polly is afraid about her own freedom. It's also possible that Polly is working so much, she's obligated to work to make money to live, that she can't even spare the time in order to be there to see how her daughter is faring in a trial where her daughter's freedom is at stake. Um, so this is this relationship of Lucy to her own family, those dislocations is something I ask you to pay careful attention to and to think about them again in relation to Morrison's novel. And the last thing I again just ask you to think about, and this is thinking about for Thursday's class, is this very interesting passage, really quite affecting, where Lucy Delaney is talking about the experience of being in the courtroom and waiting to hear the verdict. And I'm just going to read this passage to you and ask you know, a small question about it. At last, the courthouse was reached, and I'd taken my seat in such a condition of helpless terror that I could not tell one person from another. Friends and foes were as one, and vainly did I try to distinguish them. My long confinement, burdened with harrowing anxiety, the sleepless night I had just spent, the unaccountable absence of my mother, had brought me to an indescribable condition. I felt dazed, as if I were no longer myself. I seemed to be another person, an onlooker, and in my heart dwelt a pity for the poor, lonely girl with downcast face, sitting on the bench, apart from anybody else in that noisy room. I found myself wondering where Lucy's mother was and how she would feel if the trial went against her. I seemed to have lost all feeling about it, but was speculating what Lucy would do and what her mother would do if the hand of fate was raised against poor Lucy. Oh, how sorry I did feel for myself. And of course, what's happening here is a kind of out-of-body experience. She is seeing herself as if she's a witness to the trial rather than the person the trial is concerning. She doesn't really, uh, at that moment, quite feel herself to be herself, doesn't really quite feel her mother to be her mother. And the question, of course, of the relationship of self and the question of self-ownership is something that is of keen interest and it's a special power under the situation of slavery, where the relationship of you to yourself is something that's interrupted by this enormous alienation that says you do not belong to yourself. And it's that fundamental alienation of you to yourself, you to your family, where you're alien alienated precisely by belonging to your family that I think leads to dizzying passages like this and that when we get 
in the rest of the work of Lucy Delaney's thing is a kind of reintegration of consciousness that although she is denied this a full experience of family because of the tragedies and catastrophes of even the decades following slavery, uh, there is a self there that she can have that makes sense to her that does not make sense to her in the courtroom. So looking forward to talking about this text with you on Thursday.